So uh, let's talk, let's continue, let's go on to the bones, nerves, and inflammatory disease. So we can look at different kinds of trauma around the elbow. So I forgot, who's next? Uh, Michael, why don't you take this one? Okay, uh, 20, 20 year old male, both forearm pain for four months, pain. What's two, WB? Um, that's just that's a grading scale for the level of pain, moderate. Oh, okay. um, both ulnar tenderness. So on the first scan, as we have a bone scan, we see increased radio tracer uptake in the bilateral uh, ulna, kind of uh, left greater than right. Um, and on the X-rays, radiographs, we can see some like periosteal reaction. It looks pretty smooth, I believe. Okay. Um, Here's the MR. And on the MR, again, we kind of see this periosteal reaction and lifting, but it looks very smooth. The surrounding musculature is an edematous, like it's like a kind of a chronic long-standing issue. Yeah, so it's a chronic stress reaction. Like it almost looks like what like shin splints would look like, yeah. but in the ulna. So, right. so it's a chronic periosteal reaction, and, it's a, and this pattern that you just described is the uh, is the benign form. Uh, and there are a lot of things that, that can All right, so 46-year-old female with trauma. We do see some edema along the capitellum. And here it looks like there's some cortical irregularity along the capitellum. And the sagittal images can often be confusing. Uh, this area right in here is normal. That's a non-articular portion. Uh, however, what we have here, this is the articular portion, this is the articular portion, and here we have an impaction fracture of just the last couple of millimeters of the articular portion. There are many people who don't understand this uh, and who uh, will see this little non- uh, uh, articulating surface of the posterior aspect of the capitellum and call that an injury, especially on the coronal images, it gets very irregular there. But in the extended elbow, the articular cartilage of the uh, uh, humerus uh, stops right about here. So you can see that when you fully extend the elbow, you're almost, uh, you're, you're really almost not having articular cartilage contact articular cartilage. And that's one of the reasons why when you have an extended elbow, you have a very small contact area, and it's and it's uh, uh, more e it's more easy to get uh, injuries in that setting because you concentrate too much of the force on such a small cross-sectional area. The functional area of the elbow is in flexion, where this part of the articular cartilage articulates uh, with the radius. So this is actually a posterior capitellar impaction injury. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so along the medial aspect, uh, the medial epicondyle looks like there's an avulsion um, there, and then there's also some edema and impaction injury of the uh, of the of the lateral so side. Of the classic valgus injury to the elbow. Good. Okay, Michael. Here's someone who this is a day or two after the injury, so this is 9:11:07. Uh, okay, so it looks like there's a fracture of the uh, of the capitellum, kind of minimally displaced. Yeah. And, and here. This is a this is a youngster. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this this is not an adult yet. Yeah. So this is an acute impacted fracture of the uh, uh, of the capitellum. And you can see the marked injury to the subchondral bone here. And there may be there's 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 no kiss injury, is that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Right. Yeah. So this was on 9-11-07. Uh, the patient came back about six months later, and this is what it looked like. Michael. Okay, so there's significantly decreased edema, but you can kind of still see a fraction line kind of subchondral under the capitellum. 
Um, it's still not that it's not that displaced. And then so I guess you could worry about that. You could get like a post-traumatic kind of necrosis. Well, like what, an osteo what would you call this if you hadn't seen the first injury? What would I call this? Yeah. I'd call this like a subcontral fracture. Like, is it could look like Panner's disease or something? Yeah, depending upon the age, this would this would be Panner. Yeah, this is a subacute impacted fracture of the capitellum. At this point, actually, you've lost the articular cartilage, which was mostly intact before, and we're seeing all this granulation tissue uh, underlying it, uh, which is kind of the healing response. Uh, but this 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 is kind of the progression of an acute impacted subchondral fracture of the capitellum. This is subacute. and the radial head is now mature. Yeah, right. Yeah, if we go back, you can see that. Uh, that you, you got more more uh, closing of the growth plate in the interval, right? All right, uh, Jennifer. Um, so here again, we see some cortical irregularity along the capitellum. It looks like a minimally displaced fracture. Um, Mm. So most people call this an osteochondral subchondral injury. Um. So you can see if the cartilage is intact. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to determine the the, the uh, area or the cross sectional or the length of the of uh, the subchondral bone marrow edema, and also you can see there's a defined subchondral fracture here of the subchondral bone. Uh, with fluid going deep to it, so this is really an unstable little fragment there, and you need to get the size. And then obviously this hemorrhage into the joint space with the big effusion. Yeah. So that's an acute capitellar injury. As opposed to uh, this one, Ashu, what's this one? So I'm guessing this is more of a, a chronic injury. There seems to be delamination of the articulating cartilage of the capitellum there. Um, and there's cystic changes of the subchondral bone um, posteriorly, um, and it looks like it's almost completely separated with fluid. So this is this is pretty yeah. um, so, unstable. So this is an unstable osteochondral defect involving the capital. This is more a chronic phase of of the bone injury. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so there's uh, like f fragmentation of the capitellum. Okay. Um, so, let's say it looks very chronic. There's no associated edema. So this is more chronic than the last one. The last one was more chronic from the one before that. And then we saw so these are different stages. So this is uh, this chronic osteochondral uh, injury on 12707. Patient came back. A few months later, and this is what it looked like. What's going on? Um, well, they went somewhere. Right. So those loose, bodies, don't know where. those loose bodies migrated, so you have to look around to find them uh, in the interval. And then here's just an old trochlear injury where you see a large osteochondral defect. Here we looked around, and you couldn't see any bone fragments, so they'd presumably been resorbed over time, uh, but a large uh, osteochondral injury. Okay. So 15-year-old that who fell off of a skateboard, uh, we can see a mildly displaced fracture of the Capitellum, it looks like there's some apex anterior angulation and there's some cortical step off and it extends through the articular surface. Um, so it's a pretty extensive mm -hmm. There are a number of patients here. Uh, I just recommend that you kind of describe them, uh, but there are, uh, uh, and, uh, and the higher you go, the type, the, the more accommodated and difficult it is. I think it's best just to, to uh, uh, 
to describe these. Again, like we've said before, if you work with a surgeon who has a classification system they want, then you can learn it uh, and work with them. Uh, but there have been many different classifications depending upon the surgeon's interest and the way they, they like to fix these. Again, uh, the kind of important things are where it's located, does it involve the articular surface, that's, a, that's, that's important, and how comminuted it is, and that's kind of standard in, in all of these fractures. And another classification system. And there's so, there are so many different varieties of fractures that trying to classify these as kind of a, um, uh, I don't know, it, it, it never made any sense to me, okay. even when I was growing up. <laughs> okay. Uh, who's next? Who's next? Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Um, looks like there's a fracture of the coronoid process here. You see some bone marrow edema also there. And I don't know if there's a, another fracture more posteriorly, but um, I mean more superiorly, but yeah, definitely coronoid process looks fractured. Yeah. Okay. Michael, what do you think of this case? Um. So how old is this patient? It's a young um, kid. I forgot the exact age. Yeah, because I see the, the capitellum ossification center. Do not see the radial head ossification center. But I'm wondering what that kind of bony protuberance kind of off where the radial head kind of right there, what that is. Yeah, doesn't look normal. Where, where do you think that radial head may be? That's what I'm wondering if that is that, like if there's radial head that's popped off and is now down there. A big I think you're on the right track. Is there, look, there's a large joint effusion. You can see the sale sign and the big posterior fat pad and a lot of kind of soft tissue around the elbow. Uh, Here's the elbow. Uh, this. Uh, he no, I'm, I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. He couldn't straighten the elbow, so this is an MR scan with a flexed elbow. Here are the axial images. Okay, so on the axial images, yeah, we can see that that bony protuberance, it does look like it's the predominantly cartilaginous radial head is now kind of lopped over on the side, like at a 90 degree angulation. And yeah. So and what, 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 would you, what would you do with it? Uh, put it back in place. How? Uh, push it up there? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I, I, you you need to get a surgery and then a... Time. It's possible to uh, uh, replace it without the surgery. It can be done. So uh, a, a, a good anesthetic and uh, a little manipulation and it, it, it will work out. You might need some Chinese traps to put some tension on it. Uh, Chinese traps on the fingers and thumb. Okay. Uh, and then put some... Um, pull on a, a arm with a forearm straight up uh, and a traction on and, and 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 then you just push on a radial head and it'll pop back in okay usually uh, not, not necessarily every time um, but the only reason it wouldn't go back in if there was some tissue interposed and i don't think there, there is any Thanks, John. Um, all right, so here I can see some increased signal within the proximal radius. Um, I don't see any cortical breakthrough, but I'd want to look at the additional sequences. Okay. Entry without cortical breakthrough and without displacement is treated conservatively, as opposed to this one, Ashu. Here is, looks like an extensive displaced fracture of the radial head um, with angulation. Okay. Uh, here's a, uh, Michael, here's a female who had a fracture, and this is what the CT looks like now. Okay. 
Um, so they had a fracture, they had a status post, or another status post radial head arthroplasty. Um, I'm trying to figure out if the, like if it's just the angulation or if there seems to be quite a bit of a, like surrounding kind of heterotopic bone or is that just like the cuts? Yeah, I think it's kind of the cuts. Uh, but I mean, there probably is a little bit of heterotopic bone here and maybe some here. Okay, uh, I'm kind of worried that the the on that second image that the radial head arthroplasty looks a little bit angulated. I'm not sure if that was purposeful. Yeah, I uh, the, the, they really didn't do anything about this, but the patient did have pain. John, uh, you want to tell us anything about the prosthesis? Uh, we used to use silicone uh, prosthesis in the 70s. Um, Marmer and I, um, and and then they fragmented within a year, um, and then we went to metal prosthesis like this. Uh, they didn't work out too well. Um, there are prostheses uh, these days that um, that you can put in like a hinge um, to replace the elbow, um, and they. They work, but not that great. The elbow is a very difficult joint to deal with because it gets stiff, stiff so easy. Um, so actually, we don't really have any real great answers that I know of. And I, I haven't looked in the latest gambles on this issue. What about just so, the radial head? Uh, the radial head, um, uh, that's not really doing much. Uh, I don't think it's moving all that much. Yeah, but but what what about just resecting the head and not putting a press? Uh, you can remove it, but it's going to be very unstable, John. Okay. So this is a 69-year-old male status post reconstruction, and we can see some. Post-operative changes within the proximal radius compatible with reconstruction. And it looks like there's some displaced low signal intensity material along the lateral joint space. So I'm concerned that this is hardware failure with displaced hardware components. Yeah. Uh, okay. Ashu. Um, so, 59 year old male after fall. Um, we got CT images. Looks like a dislocation. Um, and here, there's some, some, there's also, I think, a displaced coronoid process fracture um, right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is just a fracture dislocation. Right. Hey, Michael, what do you think of this kid? A 13 year old, two year post dislocation. So, two years post dislocation. So, there's still there's bone marrow edema in that capitellum. Um, I was just going to image the radial capit. Uh, like the radius looks a little angulated kind of in relation to the capitellum. I don't know if that's just kind of the. It's subluxed. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I'm looking at that right there. So that's the medial epicondyl, or that's the lateral epicondyl. I'm guessing that's kind of popped off. Yep. That was, yeah. Yeah, so if you go back here, well, there's a big defect here. And this is, it was pulled off, and that's that bone fragment that was avulsed. And it's two years old. Okay. Jennifer. Is that patient that, uh, that young? I'm, I'm surprised that that wasn't taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't taken care of. There's nothing I can do about it. Right. I don't think, you, you can probably put it back, but I don't think it's going to grow normally. Yeah, if you debride it along the fragment and along the remaining epicondyle, then can you reattach it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
After two years, it won't won't uh, continue to grow. It'll just be a piece of bone. Uh, it'll probably unite, but um, it'll just be there. I'm not sure how much function it will be, but um, the muscles and so on will be that are attached to the epicondyle will probably uh, be helped. All right. Thank you. Um, so this looks like a displaced cortical fragment along the medial epicondyle, so medial yeah. epicondyle vulsion fracture. Yeah, yeah, fixing this one is easy, uh, other than you got to be very careful of the ulnar nerve. Ask you. This was a baseball player who developed uh, elbow pain. Uh, looks like there's moderate marrow edema of the olecranon. I don't see a fracture. This could just be stress or trabecular injury. Yeah, this is a common stress reaction that you see, especially in teenage overhead throwing athletes. Uh, we'll, I think we'll talk more about this later, maybe now. But uh, this is a warning sign. Uh, if they continue to do their activity with this kind of bone edema, then uh, as we'll see either today or later in lectures, uh, you'll get a fracture and you can get a displaced olecranon. So this is an electron stress reaction, which is usually very symptomatic, and this is a warning sign on MR that you have to intervene and uh, get, the, get the player to rest. Okay, Michael? A 23-year-old female kicked in the elbow during martial arts. Um, so the elbow itself looks okay. I do see this bony protuberance spur projecting off the distal humerus towards the joint. And I think this is just like that avian spur, kind of like a normal type variant. And there's the MR, right? And I, all I know is the avian spur can potentially cause like some sort of kind of like impingement. I forget of what but usually it's asymptomatic. Right, and we can see there's edema around it here. There is that bone uh, there. And then on the MR, we can actually see the fracture through the avian. Oh, the, the first fractured. Oh, okay, I see that. Had a uh, you see variant avian spur, but they fractured the avian, avian spur with the martial arts kick. Something you see every day. Um, on the radiograph, could you see that fracture? Yeah, okay. Very fine line. Yeah. That's a stress fracture. Um, so here we can see some fluid signal intensity partially extending along the olecranon. So I'm concerned that this is an incomplete stress fracture of the olecranon. So depending upon the patient's symptoms and age, this can either be normal closure of the growth plate or an incomplete fracture. So to know the significance of this, you really have to know the history and the age. This particular patient, this, this was a closing of the growth plate, and, a, and it wasn't pathologic. But if this were an older individual, then it could be a pathologic uh, partial avulsion. But, but this was just a normal closure. The, the... Why did they take the MR, John? Uh, there, was, there were symptoms elsewhere in the elbow, and I forgot. Oh, okay. Uh, ask you. Um, 18 year old baseball pitcher with posterior elbow pain, and here I think, I think you have fracture of the olecranon here. Um, yeah, um, this looks like there's, it looks like you know probably recurrent injury here. Yeah, so this is chronic repetitive traction injury. You can see a lot of bone marrow edema, and this this as opposed to the previous one, this is actually a uh, chronic repetitive stress fracture uh, from that, that's a separation of the physis and that's right uh, it's right along where the physis is and it, it's not healing and and this is a not uncommon uh, injury that you see in uh and little older than little league uh baseball players so it's something uh, can you go back to the le uh, other uh, yeah this looks to me like a fracture of the neck of the radius, that last one. 
wait, wait, wait. Uh, where, well, we don't see the where, where, what, which image? I'll go back to the, the prior one. No, next one. Uh, there was a uh, um, right here. Uh, that that looks to me like a, a fracture of the neck. This is the electrodon here. This is a um, very posterior. Oh, you're looking. Oh, I see. This is a, a, a this is right coronal right. view. Right. Uh, you got me all confused. Yeah, it's easy, right? We, That's easy. Yeah, I know. When we just show individual images like this, it's easy. Sorry. No, it's uh, perfectly understandable. So this is actually, I don't know. You could say acute or subacute. This is a hot, hot off the press injury, uh, baseball injury, where you have a traction uh, injury, really with separation along the, the uh, area of the growth plate. Uh, these actually heal very readily. If this patient stops pitching for six weeks, this will pretty much heal. So, As opposed to this next one, uh, Michael, what's, what's happening here? This is a 24-year-old baseball pitcher. Um, so I see that on the proton density image, I mean, we see the fluid signal intensity, I guess, along that posterior olecranon. And on the, this is this an arthrogram or is that T1 or is that T2, like non facet? This is a T2. This, uh, well, I, you know, I don't know. This could be an arthrogram. I'm not sure. Okay. It kind of looks like there's probably sclerosis along that line. So it's going to, you know, it's chronic. There's a fat set. Again, when you fat set, this is a T1 fat set, so this is an arthrogram. You know, it's hard to see the details. This is maybe we can see a little bit. That lets you know that it's chronic. That also lets yeah. you know that this isn't going to heal all, all that well, and it's going to be for a long time. And uh, here's what the CT looks like. Oh, yeah. And now the, the CT, you can really see how sclerotic it is. So it's kind of a non-union, partial non-union, I guess. So how would you treat this? How do you treat this? Um, well, I mean, I guess one, they need to stop throwing probably and pin it. <laughs> well, you, you got the answer right there. I don't like that particular screw, but that's all right. Yeah. So, the, the, yeah, these, when you have a lot of sclerosis like this, these don't heal quite so readily. And this previous one, that's why MR is helpful, you don't see that thick sclerosis. And these tend to heal quite readily just by rest. But once you get to this more chronic stage where you have sclerotic changes on both sides, which you can also see nicely on the CT, these kind of tend to go to non-union and uh, this required surgery. Okay. By, uh, bone next to bone uh, won't heal. It's, it's gotta be uh, raw bone. Uh, so this looks like another fracture of the olecranon, but there is some sclerosis around the margin, so this also looks more chronic to me. So this is a fairly common finding that you see in Major League Baseball pitchers, and what happens here is you get chronic repetitive impaction injury to the olecranon tip. You tend to get osteophytes and overgrowth. In fact, if you look, the vast majority of Major League Baseball pitchers, on their pitching arm, they can't fully extend the elbow. On their other arm, they can fully extend it, and that's because they develop osteophytes here. And in that process, sometimes they can uh, rapidly extend the elbow and actually fracture the osteophytes. And, and this is kind of a chronic uh, fracture-osteophyte combination here on the olecranon. Uh, when this occurs, it can cause limitation of motion. You can go in and remove these. The important thing, however, is if you remove too much bone, they become unstable. So they have to be very careful only to remove the excess bone and, and not uh, uh, make the patient posteriorly unstable. Don't remove anything that um, has a capsule on it. Yeah. So I, we talked, I think, last time uh, a little bit about the anatomy back here in pitching. And notice you've got the olecranon, which is a rod, 
And then you've got the posterior aspect of the humerus, which is a valley, and they really need to align perfectly for full extension. If, you, if they don't, if you have a valgus angulation of the ulna, then what happens, you get this rubbing and injury on the medial aspect posteriorly here, the posterior compartment. And what causes this valgus uh, angulation is obviously a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament. So what will happen if people have tears or, or tendinosis of the ulnar collateral ligament, which causes it to stretch so you get instability, you'll get this valgus positioning and full extension, and you develop the injury back here. And this in the vernacular of uh, the baseball world is called posterior impingement. And, and this is really the cause of it. And it's intimately associated with ulnar collateral ligament injuries. Um, the valgus up to 15 degrees is normal. Um, but once you get past that, uh, it's, it's bad news. Um, women, for instance, uh, have a valgus elbow uh, a little more so than men. Right. Um, uh, I've seen them as far as 20 degrees or so. Uh, but um, uh, unless you're going to be a pitcher, that, that, that's where you, the problem comes in. Right. Right, exactly. So who's next? Who's last? I don't know. <laughs> and who, who did the last one? I think I'm next. Go for it. <clears throat> well, um, I think there is some hibernation of the medial aspect of the distal humerus there. Um, and uh, I'm guessing this is a picture with the prior ulnar collateral ligament tear and maybe some posterior impingement. These are low field image, images. This is actually a coronal gradient echo, actually stir, uh, which is catching this area. This area here is the high signal area on the stir in that location. And that, that's really subchondral edema. Here are the sagittal images showing that same area in the sagittal plane right there. And this was, was a high school picture, and this was posterior impingement. And you can see the changes. So that's what you have to look for if they're concerned about posterior impingement. So this is a high school player, Michael. Uh, this was a, an older player who had been playing longer. What do we see here? Uh, uh, John? Yes. Uh, can I interrupt for a second? Uh, when when the pitchers uh, uh, follow through uh, and their elbows snap, uh, uh, the olecranon actually does that impact the humerus distally? Yes. Uh, and, and and so therefore that's a chronic trauma, isn't it? Exactly. That's right. Yeah, and, and I think that's where the, these problems. And it's not a perfectly um, straight elbow. It's a there's a valgus to it, and I, and I think maybe that that's a, a contributing factor to these things. I agree. That's right. I think so. Yeah. So, Michael, what do you think of this one? Okay, so we see edema kind of in the. Uh... In the trochlea, um, and it looks like there's cartilage loss, the only humor articulation, use of some chondral so uh, change as well. Cystic changes there. Yeah. Kissing lesion. I like that word, kissing. Yeah. I don't know why. I, I guess I grew up with that. But you're an old lover. <laughs> It's all uh, in your heart, John. Yeah. Uh, Michael, here are the axial images, T1, uh, T1 on the left and T2 on the right. Same patient. OK, now we kind of can see the subchondral sclerosis with maybe some either cystic change or a little erosive type change, kind of the ulna and the, uh, the humerus. And the ulna looks maybe slightly kind of subluxed, uh, like minimally. Yeah. Maybe a little bit, uh, and a little bit of valgus with uh, the medial overrun here, right? Yeah. So th this was a major league baseball, and uh, this was posterior impingement. And that's that's another one of those, and uh, that angle is developed by 
uh, chronic snap, recurrent snapping. Yeah. Well, why don't we stop here and I'll show some more of these and some more severe examples uh, when we meet again on Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Okay, John. I'm going to hit the uh, Campbells and see what they got to right. say. That sounds great. Good. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Have a, have a good uh, day off, guys. Uh -huh. And girls.